In this video, we're gonna take a look at a black screen Commodore 64. This weekend, I got a really special purchase off of a local seller, and that's for a future video. But along with that, I also picked up a non-working Commodore 64. There's Commodore 64 with a tape drive and a pair of power supplies, so we're gonna take a look at that and see if we can get her working starting right now. Okay, so this machine came with a data quarter. Don't think it's Commodore brand. It certainly doesn't look like any one I ever owned. And then it's in this box, which has clearly gotten very, very wet. The layers of the box are all separating from each other, so it's, it's in pretty sad shape. So inside is the machine. It's very yellowed, but uh, not looking too bad. All right, so this machine came with a, uh, a couple of power supplies and we'll take a quick look at those. The power supplies tested fine, but I would never trust these old ones without an overvolt protector like Ray Carlson's Commodore Saver. A common failure mode in these supplies, as many of you probably know, is that the voltage regulator shorts and it passes 12 volts through to the five volt rail, which will fry many chips in the machine. Uh, this little device uh, that Ray Carlson sells protects it from that. It prevents anything more than about 5.2 volts from passing through. If the voltage is good, you get a green light like I've got here. If it's bad, like you may have seen in some of my earlier videos where I had a bad one, that uh, this turns red and no voltage passes through so the machine won't run. So these things are literally a lifesaver for old Commodores, especially if you're gonna use the black brick of death. Um, these white ones, I've read are more reliable. I believe they came with the uh, C64s. Um, I still don't use the old stuff without, uh, without one of these. So now taking a look at the case, it looks like in the past somebody's put some longer screws into the main board and they've dimpled the bottom of the case where the screws go in. So we'll have to get those out of there and get the correct ones in. Also, only one of the four feet is still present on the bottom. Uh, the front looks pretty good. It's pretty yellow, but you know, with a bread bin, a lot of times that's not much different. All right, now looking inside, we have the ever-present cardboard RF shield, and these things are absolutely useless. So that can go. Um, looking at the board from the top, what I'm seeing is that one of the capacitors is damaged. Um, and that's one of the power capacitors. Also, the 12 volt uh, voltage regulator is really looking janky. Somebody's messed with it. It's got a blob of solder and all kinds of stuff. It's been bent a few times. So when I pull the screws out, the board actually is installed with the correct screws. So somebody must have had the long ones in in the past. The, uh, the bottom of the case still has the correct standoff. So I'm, I'm not sure what happened there, but nothing I can do about it now. And the other thing I'm noticing is that every chip is socketed. Well, that's gonna be fun. Okay, so while editing this video, I noticed that the idiot of a camera operator didn't have it in focus for this next section. What a maroon. But long story short, what I found was I had a black screen, no video, the PLA was so hot I could barely touch it. And since all the chips are socketed, I couldn't pull the unnecessary chips out and run a dead test cartridge test with just the basics. I did try the dead test, but it didn't do any good, didn't do anything at all. So I guess now it's time just to heat up the soldering stations and get to work. To remove the RF shield from the bottom, my preferred method is to remove as much solder as possible with a hot iron or desoldering gun then carefully heat each tab and pry it up with a small flat tip screwdriver. Now that we have access to the bottom of the board, it doesn't really look too bad at all. There's a couple of light scratches in the solder mask, but nothing that looks like it would cause issues. The solder joints for the Vic Shield are looking a bit crusty, but all the ICs look like they've never been worked on. Speaking of the Vic, I suppose I should remove the shields from the top of the Vic and the RF modulator. The character ROM's looking really crazy. Uh, looks like one of the pins started to bend when it was inserted in the board, and so it didn't go all the way down. It's not sitting flush, it's sitting at an angle. So it's all the way through the board, barely, and it is electrically connected right, but certainly doesn't look great. 
Now that we can see exactly what we have to work with, my preference is to fix then polish. So I will change out the parts that I know are problematic or that I think are really a, an issue, test it, fix it, get it working, then I'll do the rest of the capacitor replacements and do the, the full restoration. I prefer to do it that way so that when I'm trying to debug a problem, I know that it's not a problem I introduced. What can happen when you're working on something this old? At least you know it's something you messed with and, and it just makes it easier to fix. So we're gonna start out by replacing the voltage regulators, the power capacitors, and the PLA, because it was so hot. And then we'll see where that leaves us. The voltage regulators were easy to replace. I just cut them off the board and removed each leg individually. When installing new regulators, I always bend the legs with pliers so I get a good fit. When you install them vertically, then bend them over after you solder them, they don't usually fit as nicely. You also want to add thermal compound and bolt the one into its heat sink before soldering so that you don't introduce pressure on the part that could damage a trace. The caps were a piece of cake. You can just put very light pressure on each leg and heat the solder until the leg pops out, being careful not to burn yourself. Be sure to always use flux and add a little fresh leaded rosin coarse solder to each pad before removal. That'll make things a lot easier. When you're installing the caps, we just make sure to observe the correct polarity and solder them in. Again, I like to bend the leads with a tool so they look nice. So next up is the PLA, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm dreading it. Um, these things can be really hard to remove, and the easiest way to do it would be to just cut all the pins and then remove each leg one at a time. However, I'm not sure this PLA is bad, and I don't want to ruin a good one. So I'm going to try to remove the chip in one piece and get it out so that I can continue to use it if it's okay. So the key here is patience. Take your time. I'm using a fairly hot soldering iron at about 350 degrees Celsius or 660 Fahrenheit with a sharp chisel tip on it. I don't want to apply heat to the board for more than about six to eight seconds at a time. I don't want to lift traces and it's always when you just get in there and you keep heating and heating and heating and you get in trouble. So do what you can in a few seconds and then back off and let the part cool down. We'll add a little bit of flux to each pin and then some fresh rosin coarse solder as usual just to help it flow. So we use the heat gun and remove all of the solder from the bottom one pin at a time but this only gets us so far. The old solder flows very poorly, so the next step is to remove as much additional solder as possible using solder wick and more flux. It's important to do this on both sides of the board since the top side solder doesn't want to flow through when using the desoldering gun. At this point, where I've removed as much solder as possible, I like to heat each pin and using a small screwdriver, push it towards the center of the hole and hold it after removing the heat so that the pin is more likely to be free. Now one side of the IC is free, but the other side has a couple stubborn pins that just won't release. I finally had to resort to pulling very gently on the PLA while putting heat on the pins on the top side of the board until they finally came out. That thing was a pain in the butt. Once the chip was finally out, it was a simple matter to clean the pads with flux and solder wick and install a socket. I installed a PLA that I had on hand that should be good. Unfortunately, it was a desoldered pull that I got as a freebie when I ordered some uh, Phillips PLAs off of Fleabay, so I can't be certain. So now that the known issues are resolved, it's time to test the machine again, and you better bet I'll make sure that camera operator pays attention this time. And now for the moment of truth. Yes, we've got a blue screen, flashing cursor, and 38911 bytes. So far, so good. Using the diagnostic cartridge and a harness, it also looks good, so I will quickly go over the remaining restoration to be done and we can give her a real test. As I said earlier, I prefer to fix, then polish, so I'll know if the remaining steps cause any issues. As you probably know, I'm not a fan of blindly recapping any machine that's this old. The cap problem started around 1990 and this machine's far older than that. I've seen many, many, many machines that work fine with the old caps. But if you want to change them, go for it. My general rule is, is if I'm doing a lot of work on a board, I'll go ahead and recap it because it's not going to hurt anything. To me, if I have a machine that is in good working order and has never been modified, that's a virgin machine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change that. And I've never seen the caps on an old machine cause any kind of leakage or damage on this type of machine. If you've got an Amiga, 
If you've got a Mac SE30, if you've got some of these 90s machines, by God, get those caps out of there because they are a ticking time bomb. But these older caps are not the same way. In this case, some caps were damaged, so I'm not gonna leave a job half done. After replacing all the electrolytic caps and giving the board a good cleaning, I installed some aluminum heat sinks to the chips that tend to run hot. So there's a number of steps that you need to do on every Commodore 64, and I'm just gonna go over them really quick here, see how fast we can cover this. Uh, you need to remove the keyboard from the case. Uh, when I did that, I noticed the LED was a mess, so I fixed that up. I uh, removed the keycaps and springs. The keycaps go in uh, warm, soapy water, while the springs need to be kept dry. I don't like getting those wet. I uh, got to desolder the cap slot key and remove the 23 screws from the printed circuit board. Uh, three of those are under the piece of tape, but they, they come through quite easily. Once you pull the PCB, you can see which type it is. This is a carbon type. Um, you want to be careful with these carbon pads. I removed all the plungers, which is easy, just tip and dump. And then uh, remove the cap slot key. It just snaps out from the other side. Then you got to clean all the posts with microfiber and then use a little bit of alcohol on each of the pads. Uh, there's little rubber pads on the bottom that are the conductors. Just gently clean them with alcohol. Um, clean all the keys. They're in hot soapy water. I just clean each one individually. I don't think I got that on video. Uh, clean the circuit board with alcohol and then clean the housing. Just clean the whole case uh, in hot soapy water. So then I just... Uh, Reassembled the keyboard in reverse order and uh, it all looks nice and pretty. I reinstalled the RF shield on the bottom of the circuit board. I didn't keep the cardboard one. Those things are pretty useless and they're just there for ridiculous 80s RF requirements from the FCC. Uh, so reassembled the whole thing, including replacing the missing feet. So now let's see what we got. So she looks pretty good and she's working. Let's try a little Moon Patrol in a second. The one thing she could use is some retro brighting and I haven't done that in the past. Oh, we're gonna change colors, are we? I haven't done retro brighting in the past. I've just done sun brighting in the summer, but I will go ahead and get a retro bright setup put together for use in the future. And maybe we'll do a retro bright on this machine. So let's see how I do nowadays. Okay, well, thank you for sticking around. Here's that sneak peek I promised you. I picked up a Commodore SX-64. There she is. Keyboard, cable, everything's there. And best of all, it does not work. Yeah, because that would be boring. Uh, actually, best of all is... There's another non-working unit I got as a uh, parts machine with it. Uh, I actually kind of hope that I can get it working with some kind of a keyboard, USB keyboard adapter. And somebody was telling me they have, uh, somebody was saying you can get a 3D printable handle set up on uh, Thingiverse, I think it was. So maybe I can make them both work. But that is a repair video coming up in the future. So... Thanks for sticking around. I hope you like this video. And here's some more Commodore repair videos you might like. <laughs>